Our lives are filled with ups and downs, highs and lows, triumphs and tragedies. But behind it all is a nagging question. What is our purpose? What is the meaning of life, of your life and mine? Many scientists and philosophers today will tell you there is no purpose at all, but they are dead wrong. Yet frankly, most churches and religions get the answer wrong too. But there is an answer and it will revolutionize your life. You need to know. Join us right now on Tomorrow's World as we once and for all answer the question, why did God create us? Greetings and welcome to Tomorrow's World. Our world is full of heartaches and suffering. Our news feeds bring tales of international conflicts, disease epidemics, and natural disasters. Then there are the personal struggles, joblessness, financial distress, health challenges. Many people feel they have no future. Are they correct? Is there any purpose for their lives? Is there any hope that things will get better? Yes, there is. God has revealed an incredible future for those who are willing to take Him at His word. That word, the Bible, reveals truth that can be found nowhere else. Science certainly can't tell us. In his popular book, The First Three Minutes, Nobel Prize winner Dr. Steven Weinberg declares, the more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless. Similarly, biologist and evangelist for atheism, Dr. Richard Dawkins mentions in his book, River Out of Eden, the universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil and no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. No, science is helpless to discover the purpose of life, but God is not. He created each of us for a marvelous purpose and has an incredible future planned for you. A future so vast and amazing, it staggers the imagination. We aren't the first to have wondered what it's all about. Around 3,000 years ago, King David, the poet warrior of Israel, penned these words found in Psalm 8 and verse 3. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him? and the Son of Man, that you visit Him. Knowing the answer to that question, why God created you, the very reason that you exist, can completely change your life. Knowing your incredible future would change forever your life in the present. And I know that the vast majority of you watching right now have never heard this amazing truth because almost no one knows why God created mankind. The Bible makes it plain, yet the vast majority of churches refuse to teach it or don't believe it, so most have no idea at all. If you're going to watch the rest of this program, then I need you during the rest of this half hour to trust God. If you're gonna experience the life-changing effect of knowing your purpose and your future, your very reason for living, then you will need to trust God and believe what your Bible says, even when it goes against conventional wisdom. But do you have the faith to actually believe your Bible? Most don't, including most who call themselves Christians. Let me ask you, are you able to read the Word of God with the humility and faith of a small child? Luke chapter 18 records a time when many parents were bringing their children to Jesus, asking Him to bless them. Now His disciples, full of themselves and feeling that their business was too important for such things, turned them away. But Christ put a stop to that. We read in verse 16, Jesus called them to him and said, Let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, 
whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. Our purpose has everything to do with the kingdom of God, yet most have lost the ability to receive it like a little child. We're all too full of our own ideas to truly trust a loving Father in heaven and take Him at His word. Will you be the exception as we look at what your Bible says about why God created us, why He created you? We're going to see that purpose in a moment. But first, I want to give you an opportunity to request today's free booklet, Your Ultimate Destiny. It is a fast read, under 30 pages, but that's part of the beauty of it. The purpose of your life is so simple and beautiful that it isn't hard to understand, and it isn't something you should have to guess at. You can know it because you've proven it. This short free book will show you verse by verse in your own Bible what your Creator says about why He created you and what His purpose is for your life. Don't keep struggling with the question when you can begin living in the light of the answer. Welcome back. We're answering the question, why did God create us? It's one of the most important questions you can ever ask. Scientists, philosophers, and theologians have wrestled with the question for centuries and have failed miserably. But we can avoid their mistakes if we're willing to approach God's revealed Word with the trusting faith of a child. When we do so, we find that God created us to inherit glory. For instance, read what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 of the glory and power of the spirit bodies of the resurrected saints. Read Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27, which says that Christ in us is the hope of glory. But for now, let's turn to 2 Thessalonians 2 and read verses 13 and 14. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth, to which He called you by our gospel, for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Many modern Christians have spiritualized and abused the word glory until it has become sort of a fuzzy, meaningless religious word. But is the Bible fuzzy about our future glory? Just what sort of glory does God ultimately intend for you? With the heart of a child listening to his father, let us read together what God says of your destiny, your purpose, and your future. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 16, we read, The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs. Listen to this, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. God created you to share the inheritance of Jesus Christ right alongside Him. Can we understand this with the simple faith of a child? What does it mean to be a joint heir with Christ? Being a joint heir with Christ means we will actually share in His inheritance. Let's continue in Romans. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The sufferings of this present time, and there is real suffering in this present time. Many of you know that personally. Yet the Apostle Paul says that the suffering we go through is not worthy to be compared to the glory that is going to be revealed in us. Not to us, but in us. What is our destiny? What is our purpose that is so great that the horrible magnitude of the suffering of this world that it can inflict on all of us somehow pales in comparison to the glory of that purpose? Let's continue. 
for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. The revealing of the sons of God. This creation around us shudders in anticipation of the event that will wake it from this nightmare. The revealing of the sons of God. Many people, even those who consider themselves Christians, read statements like this and do not believe what they truly mean. And yet the meaning is staring at them in black and white in the pages of their Bibles. In our last segment, we looked at Romans 8 and verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Consider what that says. If we can clear our minds of the muddled thinking that keeps us from truly trusting the words we read in Scripture, can we see that something astonishing is being said here, that we are to be sons of God? You know, I have never seen a man who's had a son where that son was any less human than his daddy. In any other circumstance, you and I would accept the truth that sons grow up to be like their fathers, with differences, of course. One is always the father and the other is always the son. But both human, both living on the same plane with the same kind of existence. Why then do we tend to think that God means anything less than what He says when He says we are to be His sons and that the entire creation trembles in anticipation of the return of Christ and the revelation of those sons. Why do we minimize what God says when we just read in Romans 8 verse 17 that if we're willing to suffer with Him, to struggle against the flesh like He did, overcoming with God's help, then we will also be glorified together with Him. Look a little later in the same chapter, beginning in verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. For whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Conformed to the image of His Son, the firstborn among many brethren. Really? Do we water this idea down in our minds and fail to accept it for exactly what it says? If I took my oldest son and stood him up in the middle of a room and then scattered a few chickens or rabbits around his feet and told him, my boy, you are the firstborn among many brethren, meet your brothers. He would say I was crazy and rightly so. I am a human being and my sons are human beings. When God says He plans to make you His child and to make Jesus Christ your brother, who are you? Who is anyone to think you can claim He means anything other than what He says? God created you to one day become a child of God who is just like His Father and a part of His family, someone who exists on the same level of existence that he experiences. Let's look at another verse, this time in 1 John 3. This passage is so easy to read over too quickly without grasping the stunning truth it contains. 1 John chapter 3, and we'll start in verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. The Apostle John says that when Jesus Christ is revealed in glory and power at His second coming to rule this earth, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And what does it mean to be as He is? 
Look up John 17, verse 5. Before his crucifixion, Jesus Christ prays and asks God to return him to the glory he had with the Father before they created the world. Look up John 1, 1, where we see that in the beginning was the Word, Christ, and that the Word was with God and was God. Read Revelation chapter 1, which describes Christ as a vision of power and with a body of glory and might. Read 1 Corinthians 15 verse 49, which says that God intends you to bear Christ's glorious image. Read these things and recognize that they reflect God's plan for you. My friends, if Christ was restored to His glorious divinity after His resurrection, and if the Scriptures say many, many times that we will share His glory, share His inheritance, share His rulership under Him, share His image, share His form, share His existence, be His brothers, who are we to disagree with Scripture and fail to take God at His word? Friends, the purpose of your existence is to become a literal, full Son of God. When you realize that is the testimony of Scripture, it changes everything. How you look at life, the meaning in your trials and tribulations, your relationships with your family and your fellow man. And incredible as that truth is, there is still one more factor of cosmic importance that you must understand. I'll reveal that truth out of your own Bible in just a moment. Welcome back. We have one brief but vital point to make before we close today. We've explained that God created us to be His children. And it isn't symbolism or metaphor, but truly and fully His actual children, living forever like He does and enjoying glory and majesty like He does. So what does that mean? If God created you to live forever, then what will you be doing for eternity? Let's read another passage, this time in the book of Hebrews, which quotes the psalm that we read earlier in the program. For God has not put the world to come, of which we speak, in subjection to angels. But one testified in a certain place, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. Many scholars recognize that the author of Hebrews is speaking here of the entire universe, that God will give the entire universe to us, but they do not understand the reason why. God does intend humanity to take dominion of all things, for you to take dominion of all things, the entire universe, under Him and under Jesus Christ, who's the King of Kings. Let's continue. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that He, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. As shocking as it may seem, and as our free booklet today thoroughly proves, the testimony of Scripture is that God, who is love, is making a loving family. He is creating children in us, 
not symbolic sons of some lesser nature or degree, but real, full sons of God. Not some quasi-son or some not quite a son who lives on a lesser plane of existence, but real, full, glorified sons that will share the life and plane of existence that their loving father and elder brother share throughout all eternity. Such a purpose gives meaning to our trials and our struggles in this world. When Jesus Christ returns, those who are willing to seek and obey God in this life and allow Him to build His very own character within them will be transformed and join God the Father and Jesus Christ as a real, full part of their family forever. Can you even begin to imagine reigning on a beautiful earth alongside Jesus Christ, experiencing life and reality as God does, perhaps traveling to distant star systems and other worlds as a glorified child of the Creator God as part of His kingdom? Can you imagine living on the God plane of existence with your Creator forever? What sights will you see? What things will you do? What will be your perspective on the trials of this life after your first billion years of that life? I know these things are hard to believe. When I first heard them and saw them in my own Bible, I found them hard to believe too. I look at myself in the mirror and what I see there seems far from a future child of God in glory and power. And yet, why can't the omnipotent God accomplish such a thing? The God who created all reality from nothing. The God who shaped the very universe and filled it with wonder and power. The very God whose infinite mind grasps the entirety of creation from beginning to end. Whose power fills the seemingly limitless reaches of space and extends not only into the fiery heart of every burning star, but also into the depths of every human heart. The God who says that He has placed a longing for eternity in those same hearts. I am not bold enough to tell God what He cannot do. Are you? Who ties His hands? Let's agree with Jesus Christ when He says, with God, all things are possible. May God help all of us to look into His Word with the trusting heart of a child and see the amazing truth about why He created us and then to act accordingly.